Right, so genocide Joe Biden is stepping down and he's endorsed Kamala Harris, his vice president as the Democrats nominee. It's news that has been plastered about a plenty, not something I need to do a video on per se, surely. But one of my Patreon subscribers pointed me towards Harris's first campaign speech, and I have to admit, I wasn't really paying much attention to the internal motions of Biden and Harris's party. I'm not a liberal, I'm a socialist. Frankly, we've become used to seeing both parties in the US being virtually indistinguishable, much like our own party system here in the UK has become, without a fag paper to put between Starmer's Labour and the Tories. But I have to say, if Kamala Harris's first speech is anything to go by, then Donald Trump could be in a world of trouble. It was a damning speech as far as he was concerned. And so although my reservations remain on how much of a change from Biden Harris might be, all things considered, she might be worth keeping an eye on after this. Before I was elected a United States Senator, I was elected Attorney General of the state of California, and I was a courtroom prosecutor before then. And in those roles, I took on perpetrators of all kinds. Predators who abused women, fraudsters who ripped off consumers, cheaters who broke the rules for their own gain. So hear me when I say, I know Donald Trump's type. Right, so that was a short clip from Kamala Harris's first campaign speech. It was about a quarter of an hour long, all told, so I'm not going to play the whole thing. Running for the Democrats' presidential nomination to take on Donald Trump, now that Joe Biden has stood down. And she certainly got the measure of Trump there. The criminal prosecutor versus the criminal for the presidency. Particularly given Harris's comfortable display, might well make for far more interesting head-to-head -head than we've seen of late between two old men neither of whom ostensibly really knew what they were doing or saying from one moment to the next. Well, certainly that's how it felt. Now, my feelings on the Democrats and the Republicans as an outsider remain that they are essentially two sides of the same coin. I'm not going to come into this video eulogising Harris either. She gave a glowing appraisal of Joe Biden as part of this speech, which frankly sickened me to my core. How proud she was to serve as his vice president, yada, 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 when he's going to be remembered not for his domestic reforms, but for enabling Israel's genocide of Gaza by being the one man who could have stopped it already, leader of the one nation that has given Israel more aid and the means to continue than any other. So ostensibly her speech was in light of securing the nomination for presidency from Wisconsin, her first speech coming from Milwaukee as it did. And that clip I showed at the start was pretty much how it started once she'd done all the waving and the thank you bit. This is what makes Harris slightly more interesting than just the next Democrat to carry on with the last one left off. Because although policy-wise I have reservations from that perspective, the prospect of someone being so diametrically opposed to Donald Trump as a person, not to mention far sharper all of a sudden, made the whole US election a lot more entertaining to people outside looking in though. Where Trump seeks to hide from scrutiny, she's stated she's far more open to it. A record she's happy to compare to Trump's and... She was quite happy to stand there on stage and do just that. She spoke of taking on for-profit colleges that scammed students when she was Attorney General of California, then pointed out the fact that Trump ran one such college that scammed students. She spoke of her time as a prosecutor taking on people guilty of sexual abuse where Trump was found liable for committing such an offence. She took on Wall Street banks for fraud, which was a crime that Donald Trump was, of course, just found guilty of 34 counts on. But then came her pledges to the American people, ordinary people funding her campaign, as she put it, versus the big money of the Republicans, as she also put it, and although that's perhaps portraying what can be a very grey area between these two main US parties and make it appear remarkably black and white, what politicians choose to mention in such species, speeches and what they don't are worth remarking on too. And Harris portrayed this as a look at the past versus a look at the future. And the future she's looking at. First thing she mentioned, no child growing up in poverty. Front and centre, something our new Prime Minister here, Keir Starmer in the UK, has just rejected as unaffordable and has actually punished seven of his own MPs for voting with their consciences and voting against child poverty, voted for lifting kids out of poverty and doing what is right on this matter by withdrawing the whip from them for at least the next six months. First policy Harris actually mentioned in this speech, so... You know, it made my ears prick up, that. 
She also went on to list every worker being able to join a union. And again, I had to reflect on Keir Starmer at this point, who won't even show up on a picket line because he thinks it unseemly, despite being the party that was built by the trade unions. And whose party? The Labour Party, which has 11 affiliate trade unions to it, plus the Trade Union Congress, have all unanimously backed taking children left in poverty under the Tories' cruel and discriminatory two-child benefit gap out of poverty, which, of course, Starmer has just rejected. He won't reject that union money, though. Perhaps those unions need to sort of consider that point. Harris went on to mention affordable health care for all, affordable child care and paid family leave. She mentioned gun law reforms, the blocking of the abortion bans to outlaw that, outlaw those bans, essentially, should she become president. Showing on one hand still actually how far behind the US is behind us on some aspects, but what should also serve as a reminder that we can't stop defending our right to such things lest they be taken away. Now, manifesto promises or commitments or pledges, however you wish to view these things that Harris is saying or any politician ever says, these things are all well and good. It always remains to be seen if a politician actually sticks to their word on such things. When Harris talked after this of being the way to build up the middle classes, I cringed again inwardly because I don't see being working class as a detrimental thing. And indeed, although talking well does she mean she does she mean to build up the middle classes in that regard to lift the working classes up or is she just in it to support the the existing middle classes already in america that wasn't clear uh that would certainly be a suitable liberal move to make though saying when the middle class is strong america is strong these were her words and that really is such garbage wealth Healthy economies are always built upon the backs of ordinary working class people. And it shows why successive governments, certainly amongst working class people, and I think this is a reflection of both this country and the US, fail the working class. Why they never see any change no matter who is in power and more, and more wealth heads upwards, gets hoarded upwards. I was no fan of this comment from Harris, even if it was manna from heaven to the assembled Democratic Party throng. Where Harris was strong, and where she can certainly do the most damage, I think, and have the biggest impact, is in her direct taking on of Donald Trump. And, you know, when you're in a presidential election, that really is the, the name of the game, isn't it? Tax breaks to billionaires and corporations, cutting Medicare, paid for, and I didn't miss this, by the working class, she said. Ah, I'm finally glad she actually did remember to mention them at some point. Of course, Harris does have an advantage in that Trump is, as a former incumbent, she's got four years of what he did in power to hammer him over, what he got up to, to turn back on his him and use against him. Demonstrate what he's done before in power and would do again. And actually everything she spoke of him doing is in his Project 2025 um, manual, I suppose you could call it, 900 pages such as it is, a document full of waffle. And she was right to say in her speech, this is all insane stuff that has been tried before and has failed before, and who the costs of that failure were borne by and what she did that I thought was particularly clever is she set out her stall of looking to the future and moving away from the past is that she's been able to already cast Trump as the past. And if she carries on that as a theme, she can bruise, not just because he's a convicted felon and she's a lawyer, winning in the character stakes, shall we say, but by portraying Trump as symbolic of the past, of a has-been, of what has been done before. He doesn't even have to be ageist about it, though he is 78. But all of his policies, all of his ideas, all of his plans have all been done before. It can easily be pointed out when and where and why it failed. And him doing a rerun shows he's a man of the past. He had his time in office. That was the past. That's where he belongs. That's where he should stay. Yesterday's man. She can sell that. The crowd chanting, we're not going back. Showed they lap this up. Even if I did find her agenda a little bit deficiency policy-wise too. If it's all wired up to benefiting middle-income earners. Near the end of her speech, though, she spoke of not wanting to live in a country of chaos, fear and hate, but one that respects the rule of law. She asked those assembled, are they ready to fight for freedom in America? And although I accept foreign policy was not something she touched on at all in that speech, I hope it comes up in a future speech. The omission of any mention of the ongoing business in Israel, particularly when she talked up workers getting unionized, when US unions are today demanding Biden stop all military aid to Israel stood out for me. Netanyahu has currently gone to the US right now, brought suitcases of dirty laundry, as he apparently he always does, and expects to go away with reassurances that weapons will continue unabated so he can 
carry on expanding his crazed war in the Middle East, not exclusively with Gaza anymore, but Lebanon and Yemen. And it's only going to grow from there as his only way to fundamentally stay in power. Functionally, Biden should be cutting him off. Enough is enough. But what would Kamala Harris do? Will she just carry on just as Biden has or is she going to actually change? I want to know. I'm sure a great deal of Americans do as well. But going back to Trump, though, he's clearly worried by Harris. Not only is she not going to be the rollover Biden was turning out to be, she's clearly sussed out how to hurt him most effectively. And this is certainly being borne out by Trump's claims from Trumpers, should we call them, his supporters. Trumpers. This thought always reminds me of a fart and Trump is a bit of a bad smell. Claiming this is a fix, this is a coup, simply because their game plan has now had to be tossed out of the window and they're going to have to work a bit harder. That, I think, is the most appealing part of this run by Harris. She's still to be nominated by the by the Democratic Party as their presidential candidate. But she's already out polling Trump 44% to 42%. And she's only just getting started. This was her first speech. She's rattled him already. And he is now going to have to put more effort into this race to win it. It's not quite looking like the walkover he might have thought it was. For Harris to be successful, though, I also think on foreign issues, she does need to put some clear water between herself and Biden. So many people are as upset and appalled in the US as they are everywhere else at the constant arming of Israel. Congress was taken over by 400 American Jews over Netanyahu's arrival over there, saying no to more genocide. And so it remains to be seen as to whether Kamala Harris will indeed deal with that situation a lot better than her predecessor, should she become the first female president of the United States. Meanwhile, the US and the UK both apparently joined Israel in a retaliatory strike on civilian areas of Yemen, after the Houthis' successful uh, strike on uh, with a drone on Tel Aviv. Exactly the sort of move we're sick of in both countries, getting dragged into this, getting included in it. But we've elected Keir Starmer, who gave the nod to this action, showing he's absolutely no change from Rishi Sunak before him, already well known here as an ardent Zionist. Kamala Harris has a chance to change that in the US. And that will no doubt influence our foreign policy here at that. So it does appeal, it does, this, this does apply to us over here. We should take an interest in what is happening in America. She'll be more highly regarded around the world for certain if she does do the humane thing and changes tack, should she get the top job. Check out that Yemen story in this video recommendation here, and I'll hopefully catch you on the next video. Cheers, folks.